What's up y'all, this is Carolina Doc PT, and coming at you with another car video. I, I will stop doing these eventually, but again, they're so easy to do. Um, anyway, what I wanted to talk about today uh, is an extenuation of the last video that I did. So if you didn't see that video, I will link it at the end here. Uh, but this is part two, following up on that one because um, I am a complete moron. <laughs> um, I realized as I was loading that video up that I hadn't discussed um, in that topic of um, looking at infections and um, blood clots, I didn't discuss prevention and how you um, can go about reducing your risk of developing those things. So uh, that's what this video is going to be about. And if you haven't seen the first video, you can click over and uh, check that one out and then come back and watch this one. But there are a few things that can be done to help reduce the risk of um, infection and blood clots. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. So first of all, for the infections. So when you came home from your knee replacement or your hip replacement, you were um, your dressing um, or your incision that the surgeon uh, used to, to uh, perform the surgery was covered with a dressing of some sort. Most of the time, at least I should say, the the surgeons in our area where I where I live and the, and the with the patient type uh, that we see here, um, most of the time those are covered by what's called an aquacell dressing. That is a non-removable type dressing. It will run the length of uh, the surgical incision, and it is an airtight dressing. It's a water, um, well, water pretty well watertight dressing, although you shouldn't swim in them and you shouldn't sit and, you know, uh, get into a bathtub or anything like that. You're not supposed to get them soaked. Uh, but um, that kind of a dressing is designed to stay in place for 14 days. And then at day 14 is when that's removed. The reason for that is they're trying to protect uh, the incision and to uh, reduce that risk of an infection actually um, coming into uh, that uh, the incision uh, that it was was closed up. So even though it was closed up, there's still at the, at the microscopic level, it's still possible for little particles to potentially get in. At least that's how some surgeons feel. Now there are um, some surgeons that I work with here they're they're in the minority they're not um uh the um, majority by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but some will actually uh, send a patient home with uh, just gauze covering uh, the uh, incision. And then what they're expecting is that the patient uh, has already been taught when they left from the hospital, or they're being going to be taught by uh, their home health uh, nurse or home health physical therapist that comes in um, how to remove that dressing, remove the gauze, and then replace that gauze with um, with more dressing to cover that, usually until the drainage uh, uh, stops uh, coming from uh, the, the incision. So, um, as I say, it's no, it's normal to get some drainage, and if you have some drainage and it goes onto gauze, and if that drainage in that you know even little bits of blood and dried blood, if that stays there, you know then that can lead to um, an infection point. And so that's why you want to change out the dressings daily and keep the dressings clean. Um, and that way it's it's helping to reduce that risk of uh, developing an infection. Um, so all of those, well, basically following the process that was, uh, or the, the, the plan of care that your surgeon um, developed for uh, the incision care is what you're going to want to do. Uh, the hospital, usually like nine, nine times out of 10, the hospitals around um, us will go ahead and discuss this um, at the patient discharge. And so that way you're already fully versed on that. Um, then when at, once we come in um, and f from a physical therapy standpoint or from a, a nursing standpoint, or once you come to, to outpatient, sometimes patients will not have home health come in. Sometimes they'll come to see us in outpatient patient, um, then at that point, then uh, we can re-emphasize what uh, um, the nurses and uh, uh, folks said at the hospital as far as how to continue with that care. Um, but your your job will be basically following 
whatever plan of care that was. If it is the AquaCell dressing that's designed to be there for 14 days, then to reduce the risk of infection at the incision, whether it's at the knee or whether it's at the hip, is you just leave that thing alone. Don't pick at it, don't play with it, don't take a bath with it, don't soak it in the shower. Um, usually you're gonna wanna cover that with a, um, uh, press and seal over top of that aquacell dressing just to try to again keep microscopic stuff out yeah generally will tell uh, patients a lot of times like look if you're taking a shower stand with your leg outside of the stream and like if you're washing your hair try not to let um the soap and stuff that comes out of your hair when you rinse it out run down over that part because again you're thinking about microscopic uh, levels of bacteria that could get into the infection or get into the incision site potentially get underneath that dressing um, and then potentially lead to an infection so those are all the kind of superficial uh, infection potentials um, there there is another type of infection I'm not going to really address it here because there's really not much you can do about this type of infection which is um, something that is actually coming from the surgery itself um, that is, uh, that does happen, um, but a lot of times that's not seen for several months down the road. The, the times and the patients that I've had that have had that as an issue, um, like I can think of off the top of my head, a few uh, hip replacements where uh, they had recovered well and all of a sudden they come back um, into physical therapy because they're starting to have pain again in their hip and they're like like nine months, 10 months down the road. Um, and then it turned out that, that uh, the, the couple of patients I'm thinking of, uh, that in, increased pain at that point was their sign and symptom of an infection. Turned out there was an infection there in the joint um, that was there from the um, actual surgical part. So the, sur the, the uh, s hardware that was installed um, actually hadn't uh, been disinfected appropriately and there was still particulate on uh, that hardware and the person wound up having a, uh, an infection from that. So that that's the type of, in the main type of infection that I'm talking about with covering the incision and all that, these are the ones that you might see immediately after the surgery, but there is another type of infection um, after having an orthopedic surgery that you would see kind of later down the road. Um, and that's kind of how that relates. But again, there's not a lot that you can do to prevent that on uh, the back end. That has to be prevented on the front end by the surgeon and the hospital staff and all that. And so you want to do your research and make sure if, you, if you're listening to this before you have uh, one of those types of surgeries, make sure that you are um, that you're going to a hospital where uh, they don't have a lot of um, those types of issues. And you should be able to find that. If you research, you can look in star ratings and and, and different things uh, to find out. You can look at reviews and, and you can find, it's out there on the internet if you will search uh, at the hospitals that, that you're gonna be going to. So that's all potential uh, infection control and trying to prevent uh, infections. And that's what you would actually do to try to minimize the risk. You're basically gonna leave the dressing alone if it's not meant to be removed if it is meant to be removed then you want to consistently change those dressings uh, so that uh, it, it doesn't get uh, it stays clean and it doesn't get infected um, so that's infection the thing that you the things that you would want to try to do to help prevent a clot there actually are a few more things uh, then that you can actually uh, do uh, especially coming coming from a physical therapy perspective so for blood clots one your surgeon is likely already uh, trying to address this with you and that is going to be uh, with a prescription of aspirin. Most surgeries uh, that I can think of and uh, uh, right now most surgeons are all putting patients on aspirin. Um, again you're going to want to follow what your surgeon dictates um, and, and stuff for that and because some people might not be able to take that at which point again they need to talk to their medical uh, providers about all that type stuff but uh, usually your surgeon is going to want to uh, put you onto um, an aspirin Aspirin, that's going to provide like an internal uh, kind of prevention a little bit of developing a blood clot that's actually um, not an anticoagulant it's actually an antiplatelet 
um, but it can just help to uh, reduce the risk of that oftentimes. Uh, but again, this is all based off of what your surgeon orders. If you have not been ordered by your surgeon to take aspirin, do not start taking aspirin until you talk to one of your medical professionals about that. Um, but usually a surgeon will do that to try to reduce the risk of blood clots. From a physical therapy perspective, there are some things you can do to also help reduce the risk of blood clotting. That is going to be movement. That is why we are um, really stressing uh, with you when you first uh, come out, come home, or when you first are uh, waking up, even in the hospital, or um, you know those first couple of weeks. Really important that you are getting up and moving every about 30 minutes to an hour. I will tell patients um, oftentimes uh, to just keep circulation going. You're trying to continue to work muscles and, and that muscles will push down on, on the veins and help send blood flow uh, back to the heart. Also, if you are sitting, Jilly would recommend every about 30 minutes of sitting, I would do about 30 ankle pumps. Just trying to do a little bit to get, again, blood flow going and not letting your blood just sit where the potential for coagulation and stuff is greater. So doing ankle pumps, uh, like in the hospital, uh, they will try to prevent blood clots by putting the little uh, puffer things around your legs uh, that'll that wake you up when you're trying to sleep because they keep pressing and, and, and it's hard to sleep with them. Uh, but anyway, that is that that is um, being done because they know that well if we press on your leg then that will push on the veins and then that will help to send um, it'll help to kind of push the blood flow back to the heart it also helps uh, to put to clear out excess fluid uh, so you're in the body your lymphatic system which is what helps to, to move fluid around in your body there's not really a pump for that um, it's not not really there is no pump for that the actual way that your lymphatic system gets fluid back to the heart so then it can be distributed out to the body and you can kind of often you know go to the kidneys and then pee it out um, is through uh, the contractions of your muscles your muscles contract they squeeze on your veins they squeeze on those uh, little lymphatic tubes and then that pushes all of that fluid and excess um, or excess fluid it helps to push that all back to the heart um, so uh, helping to or helping to movement is going to help to decrease the risk of your developing a blood clot. Again, some of this is, is sometimes blood clots are not going to be prevented. It's, it's going to be, have to do with your background. It's going to have to do, um, with, you know, what your, your, you know, you may be more predisposed, um, to, uh, having a blood clot. If you, um, have a, uh, uh, it's like a, well, there, there's some things, uh, and I'm not going to get into it because it gets, it can get really complicated, but, um, there are, uh, certain people who just are prone to clotting. And so with those folks, they're going to want to do all of these types of things we're talking about, uh, because not everybody's had those tests to find out if they are prone to clotting. That's pretty much why most surgeons are going to treat everyone the same and give aspirins. And that's why most PTs are going to treat everybody the same, which is going to be okay. We need to get you moving. You need to move frequently, low intensity. You need to move often. Uh, and then we need to get you doing ankle pumps. We need to make sure that your muscles are constantly moving. Even when you're sitting down, you're doing lots and lots lots and lots of ankle pumps just helping just your body to kind of process all of that so you can prevent um, uh, just uh, fluid and blood flow just sitting uh, which is what may lend itself more to having a, a clot so I hope that this has provided a little bit of extra information that the first video did not um, so to give people a few ideas and a few ways that you can actually prevent um, having developing an infection and prevent um, developing a clot. Um, it's neither one of them are going to be foolproof because there are more things at work than just what we're talking about. But what I've, I've suggested here are are would be uh, physical therapies, quote unquote, answer uh, to um, trying to address and decrease the risk of development of infections and blood clots uh, following orthopedic surgery. Well, I did want to state one other thing here, just to, just to reinforce uh, what was said in my last video. Infections and blood clots are both rare. They do not happen a lot, okay? 
Um, so this is not something that you should be like overly worried about or anything like that. Um, it's not anything to keep you up at night, you know, uh, worrying, but they do happen. So that's why you want to watch and get all the information in my first video. So that way, you know, the signs and symptoms that you're looking for, for both infections and clots. And then that's why you want to listen to this video as to why, um, or, or as to what you can actually do to help just reduce the risk of you developing clots um, after your uh, knee or hip surgery. Uh, so they are rare, don't need to be worried about a whole bunch, but they do happen. So you do wanna be aware of them and uh, how you should respond and all that, just in case uh, you were to be in that situation to develop one of those. So, um, all right, thanks a lot. and. I hope that this helps. Yeah, we'll catch you next time. All right, y'all have a good one. Later.